Hi, everyone. I hope this finds each of you so very well. Today, I'm speaking to you from my studio in West Orange, New Jersey. Absolutely delighted to have this opportunity to interview a truly remarkable woman. Dr. Ingrid Hankala is not only a marine scientist and an author, she is also a light worker, a meditation teacher, a Reiki healer, and an international speaker who had an amazing near-death experience at the age of two. Ingrid, who is married and has a son, will be speaking to us today from Picayune, Mississippi. Ingrid was born and raised in Bogota, Colombia. After she graduated college with a degree in marine biology, she continued her education, receiving a PhD in marine sciences with an emphasis in biological oceanography. She is now a successful and accomplished scientist in this field. When Ingrid was little, her parents discovered that she could see and hear things that no one else could. All this seemed to be tied up with the aftermath of Ingrid's near-death experience when she drowned at the age of two. Not long after, she started to communicate with beings of light who have guided Ingrid through a journey of miracles, not just around the world, but also through the barriers of time. With them, Ingrid has been able to access past life experiences of herself and others, future events, and eternal wisdom. Ingrid describes her fascinating life and her experiences with the beings of light in her very compelling book titled A Brightly Guided Light, How a Scientist Learned to Hear Her Inner Wisdom. I'm so looking forward to talking with Ingrid about her book, The Beings of Light, her insights about the importance of healing, and so much more, and what is surely going to be a riveting and enlightening interview. Hey, Ingrid, a warm, heartfelt welcome to Grief oh. and Rebirth podcast. Oh my gosh, Erin, thanks so much for having me here. I feel so blessed, so honored in your presence, doing this incredible, incredible work of sharing your light with the world too. Thank you, Ingrid. Thank you. I think we are both a mutual admiration society here. So I want to begin our interview with this question, because I know that you have so much to share with all of our, everyone in our audience. So you have had two near-death experiences. Please tell us about your first near-death experience at the tender age of two and how you were able to recall both your drowning and that near-death experience as you grew older. Yes, Irene, that uh, incredibly, yeah, that, that near-death experience being so young opened for me the, the path of awakening and, and spirituality. And it all happened. It was an accident. Um, I At the time, I was in Colombia, as we mentioned. I grew up with my parents, my sisters there. And my parents had to work and they would leave us at the care of a maid. And she was a lady that really didn't pay much attention to what we were doing when my parents were not home. So one morning they left and the lady went to her room to do her own thing. And my oldest sister, she was close to four. I was close to three. We look at each other and like, no one is watching. Let's go play in the patio. And in this house, there was a patio and in the corner of this patio, there was a big tank. The, the purpose of this tank was to collect water for hand washing clothes. And it was, a, it held about 900 gallons of water. Wow. So yes, this was a, a big tank. And um, my sister saw a ball and she's like, oh, let's play ball. I'm like, across the tank. And then we climbed the tank and she, flat, she sat on the flat surface that was next to the tank. It was the surface that uh, people would use for scrubbing. So she was a little bit more safe, safer there. I went to the other side and it was a thin edge. 
Oh my and God. I bended my legs, Irene. I'm just there, but at two years old, what is the danger? Let's just have fun. And my sister threw the ball at me and she didn't apply enough force. So the ball fell in the water, on the water, and it was floating on the surface of the water. And I leaned forward, tried to grab it. And when I touched it, it rolled. I lost my balance and I fell in the tank. So this uh, here um, will answer the question that, that people, people ask me, how can you forget? How can you remember this if you were so young? How can you just not forget these things? And is I said to people, because there was many things that happened through all the experience that brought a lot of contrast. First, imagine uh, this sense of falling in the water. And the first thing was that the water in the tank was frigid cold. I mean, because people have the misconception that because I am from Colombia, I come from hot weather country. <laughs> but Bogota's high up in the Andes, almost 10,000 feet. So the temperature in this water that early in the morning was about 30, 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So the moment I felt this water was the sense of like, <gasps> it was frigid cold. And now I am just like, oh, and the next thing, imagine that this moment now, the trauma I experienced when I realized what happened, why I cannot breathe. I never have been in a pool. We didn't have a bathtub. So I didn't know, I mean, didn't have idea that if you fall in the water, you drown. And now I'm like, why well, I cannot breathe? The horror was intense. And then when I am in this state of absolute terror, how can I come out of this tank and breathe? I went from that state in just a flash to one of absolute peace. It was just quiet, calm, serene. Oh, so it was not, there was no need to breathe. There was no need to escape out of the tank. There was not need to do absolutely anything. I didn't even, I didn't know what happened, Irene, but it was just a state of complete well being. The other things, what now I'm bringing to you that shows incredible contrast was the few things throughout this experience. The, the first thing, I fall in this tank and this area was, the tank was made of cement and it had a, a roof on top. So this area was very dark. So when I am in the water, before I, I went to the state of peace, the last thing I saw with my eyes open and in the state of terror was darkness the darkness of the space. And then when I went to the state of peace, oh, I'm just relaxing, wow, this is good. And I see a light that come from below. So in this moment, that darkest space turned into light. And I, I am just, it was like the light of a candle that was lit and, I, and the light came from below. And I'm like, wow, now there is light. The next contrast was that uh, I live in a very noisy house. And the last thing I heard when I was in the state of terror was my heart pounding in my chest. I could hear it in my head. Imagine when you're in that state of anxiety, terror, and it was boom, 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 boom. Wow. And Irene, it went quiet. There was not more noise. So it was like, I was used to the noises in the house, the, 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 the noise that we usually hear from everything. And at this moment, everything went silent. And for me, Irene, is what I call as the silence behind the silence. And I crave this silence for the rest of my life. 
later in my life, Irina, I will hide in closets, in chapels, in wherever it was, because I wanted to go back to that silence. Not knowing that that was not outer silence, it was inner silence. silence. And then the other big contrast, so at this moment, like, um, now I'm in the state of oh, just joy, peace, feeling absolutely great. And then I started to see bubbles suspended in the water. And these bubbles were surrounded by light. And it was by seeing these bubbles that, wow, this is so cool. I turned around and I saw a body suspended in the water. And then when I saw the body, Irene, I had at that moment the clear realization that is my body. I wasn't surprised. I wasn't afraid. And it was the sense of, oh, that's normal. That already happened. I'm familiar with this. <laughs> so it's just... And it comes the, the what I was bringing the, the other contrast was that I was born as a very sick child. And sometimes people wonder how, why a child will be born sick. But through time and with all, I, I just see the, the perfection and the, and the symbols, how life talked to us through symbols. And at that moment, and, and later in my life, realizing that I was born sick because there was a purpose in this. And at that very moment, the purpose for the moment I'm, I, I'm having this experience is realizing that, oh, I don't want to be in that body because it doesn't feel well. And I was in the state of absolute well being. And from the time I was born to the time I drowned, I always felt unwell. Irene, I didn't even know what well-being was. Wow. And now when I'm feeling so well, of course, I don't want to go back there. So at that moment, I made that decision. And I look at the body and I'm like, uh-oh. Well, it was okay, but I'm happy you're over here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I turn around and I left the body behind. And when I... uh left the body and turned, I started to see flowers that were blooming from nowhere. And I was picked up by the flowers. And now I am be being carried by these flowers and I am just, I just in a state of complete relaxation. I, would, I was in a state of bliss. And I said to people, the analogy that is like, as when you're being uh, back to the womb, you don't have to do anything. You're just being done and you're warm and you're cozy and you're good. And then I, when I am in this state, that's what come next is, is just incredible, incredible irony because it's the validation from other people about the experience. And what happened was that in just a flash like that, I appear in the maid's room and I am floating above her bed. And I'm looking at her from above, like if I'm in the ceiling and I'm like, oh, that's Maria. And she was listening to the radio, listening to soap operas. I can't, I even remember that. That is how. Well, and you were only two years old. So it's obvious your soul, which is not two years old, just your body was aware of everything. I love that you just mentioned that, Irene. Because that's very important because people get sometimes stuck in the idea you were two years old. No. <laughs> Your eternal soul saw everything, but that body was just a two-year-old body. Exactly. Thank you for bringing that up. Yes. So I'm looking at her from above and I, and because she didn't pay any attention, she, she just kept listening to her soap opera again. In she had a soap opera going on in the tank but she didn't know that <laughs> exactly she was just completely into her thing and she did not have any awareness of what was happening so from there in just a flash like that i appear in my mom's path and this is what blows people's socks away because i look at my mom again i'm floating above her she didn't have a car 
and she had to walk from the home. She left that early and she was close to her bus stop. I have to tell you, I mean, this was a big neighborhood. She had to walk about uh, close to 10 minutes to get to her bus. And so she was walking and then I met her right there and I'm like, oh, that's mom. I ring the moment I said, that's mom, she stopped. She did not hesitate. She did not give another step and she knew immediately something is happening at home with wow. one of my babies. And she turned around and started to run back home. She's psychic also, she had, she had the gift. She was incredible, she was very intuitive, but I always say to people, it's not just about having a good intuition, it's about learning to listen to your intuition. And that's something my mom did. Thanks God, because she went back, she is running back home and I just kind of like, oh. And at that moment that she ran away, I changed my focus of attention and I saw a dog at the end of the road. And the moment I saw the dog, I was with the dog because I love animals and I'm just, wow. Ah! So I was, oh, what just happened? And the moment I looked to the horizon and, and again, and it was like a park, I was at the park. So I started to play this game, Irene, of going places. Of course, I'm having fun. You're not trapping <laughs> limitations. You're not trapping your body anymore, oh. right? Yes. So again, just to, to mention time and space, it was just the sense that it just vanished. And I'm having fun playing when, again, in just a blink like that, I appear in a realm. And this realm was made of pure, bright, intense, shiny light. And I just, oh, I really was the first time in my three years, almost three years, that I felt that I was home. And you were. Yes. And I just, again, it was the sense, what we call home, of course, I had to feel familiar. It was, oh, oh I'm back home. And it was at that moment, even the, the sense that not even almost three years had passed, it was just like, like I just say to give an example, like you just leave in the morning to go to school or to go work and it was the evening and just, just back. It was just the sense of time was gone. And I didn't see anybody at that moment, but it was the sense that I was being welcomed, that I was being embraced, that I was not alone. I'm like, oh, this just feels so good. And it's when I started to realize that, oh, uh, you know, although I saw my body suspended in the water, it was the sense of, oh, you know what? I am not that. I'm not that. And it's when I realized myself as a being of light. And it was the sense that I was dissolving with the whole. But I was still having a sense of self. You saw yourself as a being of light or you saw the beings of light? I saw myself. Wow. As a being of light. I realized I am a being of light. And then there was the, 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 at that moment, like this, even these feelings um, change when I it, it went like even farther when I felt that there was not a sense of self. Some people call it emptiness. I call it nothingness. But when people hear the word nothingness, they, they feel afraid. But I said, no, it was the sense of nothingness because it was nothing I knew, but it was the sense of wholeness because I was now part of the whole. And when people ask me about what nothing means or can you split, I said, the moment I tell you what is, it becomes something. So I just know that it only can be experienced. And the only thing I can say that this is, Irene, is, is just that sense of absolute presence and pure consciousness. And when I am in this state of being, just being, I, there's nothing else I can say about it. My mom finally arrived home. 
And she, this is the other incredible thing. We live in a big house, but she knew exactly where to go. Wow. She right, went right to that tank? She did. Wow. She directed herself to the back of the house. And this is another thing. Look at the purpose of everything. My sister was still there because she could have leave the place, go look for the maid. We, we don't know. People ask me why she didn't go to the maid. And I said, because we were afraid of this lady because she mistreated us. So how could she say Ingrid is there? We were in trouble at that moment. So she stayed there trying to help me, but she was too little. But the purpose is to show my mom, mom, Ingrid is there and I cannot get her. My mom jumped into this tank, got me out. And my mom, uh, she worked with children. Look at the synchronicities and how amazing life is. And she knew how she learned how to do CPR for children. So she did what she knew to do and she's doing everything she could do to revive me. But she said, I would like a raggedy doll. No pulse, no breathing. And I really, I was in my state of- You were, you were in ecstasy and it was just your body <laughs> she was working on. So I didn't feel anything. I was completely disconnected from this reality. So my mom did everything she, she knew to do. And it's when I felt the sense again, like everything in this experience again and again in just a flash, it was the sense that I had jumped from the tallest building in the world. And there was nothing I could do to stop this, Irene. It was nobody asked me, you want to come? No, no, that happened to me. It was just like, I'm falling and I'm being vacuumed back into the body and there's nothing I can do to stop it. And I'm like, no, I don't want to go back there. <laughs> <laughs> then my, the, now I knew I was back when all the feelings of discomfort, when all the feelings of just pain and cold and being trapped in a body happened. And oh, Irene, I was not a happy child. It was not something I want it. And, and things went difficult from there, Irene, because I came back with an awareness I didn't have before. So I would look at my parents and realize that they were not just my biological parents. I felt them as my equal. At I a soul would, level, you were seeing people on a soul level. Yes. Yes. And I would look at myself and say, I'm not this child that like you mentioned before. I'm not this child. And I was having such a hard uh, time because I couldn't relate with what was happening at this level, the physical level. And I would look at other children and just say, what is happening to these people? They don't know anything. You had become conscious at such a young age. You were aware of everything. Exactly. And most of us are very unconscious in our lives. In fact, we're given amnesia. To yes. To achieve what we have to do. Um, and your amnesia got taken away. You, you knew. It did. So, so imagine uh, it, it was pretty hard, Irene, because I would look at myself in the mirror and I will, and I said, mom, you don't understand. I'm not this person. I should not be here. And, and I, I felt the sense I should not be here because I felt so different from everyone else. And I will cry. My mom didn't understand what was happening. Imagine Irene, it was early seventies. Nobody there in Colombia knew about near their experiences, none of this. And the other thing that happened is that even to just show things at a level of, I would just say the human experience at a physical level, I started to show um, talents and, and things I didn't have before. So um, to, um, as I, we are mentioned, I was only almost three years old and after my near death, no long after now I could read and write. I could resolve mathematical problems. I wow. could put together complex puzzles and it continued. And my, the sense is like when people were talking to me or teaching me things later in school, I, I was like, I don't need to learn all of these. I'm just remembering. It's amazing. How long were you actually in that tank? I, you know, I mean, they, they, they don't know for sure, but it could have been at least um, nine, 10 minutes. It's amazing your mother was able to revive you and there was no, that's the other part, and there was no brain damage or anything. 
there was not an, an incredibly yeah, the, that's another look at the perfection of everything that the water in this tank was frigid cold and that was what uh, later and in, in studying the cases like these you know that thankfully this water was able to keep to help yes keep, keep uh, lower the the amount of oxygen that the brain require and the other thing is that oh yeah although I didn't thanks God nothing happened at the level of of the brain um, my condition, my respiratory conditions went worse, but we can talk about that. Oh, we'll get to that one. We'll yes. Get to that one. What did these beings of light look like to you? And I know they taught you about people being special and they had a perspective that it's good for a soul to have a human experience. Yes. Yes. And, and, oh, this is, I, I love your questions because yeah, but first we, we can, go each one, but um, with the beings of light, um, the experience was incredible, Irene, because um, right after my near that experience, I started to have what we know now as auto body experiences. And then, um, you know, I, I, I'm just going to bring something here quick because I always say to people that after my near that experience is like the door never closed. Right. And no long ago, the being so light said to me, of course, the door never closed, Ingrid, because there is no door. <laughs> due to conditioning, due to all the stuff, to beliefs, to, ah, uh, we just create blockages, we create layers, and then now we create a door. But the sun is always shining for everyone, always, always. So I love to bring this because it, we are the light. But what happened, I'm having these out of body experiences. And then in one of these journeys, I uh, was surrounded by star like figures. And they were so shining. Did they look human or they were they were lit or what so people are trying to imagine what they looked like. They, uh, in this in this first encounter, they just look like like say like a like a sun, like a stars, like a stars, just bright light Working around you but they had all different colors and they were all over the place. I mean, you could see them like if you are looking at night at the, at the sky, like if they look like infinite. Wow. infinite. And then that's how I, I saw them at the beginning. And, and I didn't know what it, I just, it was, I'm having these out of body experiences and I am being back in that realm of the light and now I'm surrounded by all these lights and wow. This is just incredible. And I imagine I right now all I wanted to do was to sleep. And in one of these journeys, I saw um, one of these lights, it was shining, just imagine like a, like a bright bulb, like a little sun, and it was shining in pure gold. And it, it approached me. And when it approached me, it shaped itself into a human form. Wow. To show me we are the same. And that's why I call them beings of light because at the moment I, it shaped itself, oh, and it touched me. And the moment it touched me is for me to have that recognition, that knowing we are the same. <gasps> it's when I say you are a being of light. Would you say that this is the way each of us looks when we cross over, that we become a being of light? Yes. Oh, and we actually, in, in oh, the, 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 source that we are we are this light we are always the, the say that we're just wearing like clothing <laughs> we're wearing our earth suits <laughs> yes exactly i like that like a suit but we we are light we are made of light yes and they would talk to you they would teach you things about people being special or why it's good for a soul to have a human experience how did that come through you just had the thought in your mind and they, they were telling you these things Oh, no, it, it, it was beautiful, um, um, Irene, because uh, at the beginning, I only saw them as light and I, when the, and I could smell them when they started to, because later I stopped seeing them just in my auto body experiences. And then it was a day I was, I'm taking a shower and I saw a beam of light shining in the bathroom, like intense blue light and it just shaped and I'm like, oh, now the beams of light are here. And I started to see them here. And at the beginning, I only could see and smell and sense the presence. It was like, 
they just smell like flowers. Wow. And, and I'm like, oh, so, but it, nothing else was necessary, Erin, because in their presence, I felt so well that I started to heal. Because by then, I didn't want to be here. So I, I refused to eat. I, I was just really sick. Oh. I didn't even want to be touched. You were a doll for your mother. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yes, my <laughs> poor <laughs> mom. <laughs> <I'm> like, <"No." laughs> I didn't even be like, oh, mom, sorry. Then, then, yeah, my mom had to deal with a lot with me. And uh, it's just, you, you know, it was a moment when my mom even apologized. Sorry if I didn't understand. <laughs> well, what, but, did they, what did they tell you about people being special? Yes, yes, let's get to that. So there was a, a moment when I now started to hear, to listen to them. And, and the reason why I started to listen, I want to get to that, but it's just because I was feeling so different from everyone else. And I couldn't relate with my name, Maureen. And it's when they will ask me, uh, Ingrid, they will call me and say, don't call me like that. That's not my name. And when they said, I said, well, we should call you. And I said, I do not need a name. And it's when the beings of light started to talk to me. And you asking me how it was with voice. I could hear. I could, I would just say it's the inner listening, is the inner, <laughs> our right. inner ears. Right. And I could listen clearly. And they said to me, it's going to take time for them to understand that names are not needed in the realm of the light. They also uh, said to me that all the things that were happening and what was going to happen was not for me to keep, but to give to others. Which is what you're doing now. Exactly. And I said to them, but uh, I kept feeling so different from everyone else. And I said, why me? Why this is happening to me? And it's when they said, because you are special. And I said, what do you mean when you say that I am a special? They say, everybody is a special, but not everybody knows it yet. So what they were meaning was that everybody is the light. Everybody is, and you know, recently, um, Irene, they gave me this beautiful analogy. Just think that you have that lamp back there, a light that has a light bulb and the light is always on. We are that light. And what happened when you put a shade in, on that lamp, you created a layer. Now you can see the light a little less. What if you put more and more and more and more shades? That is what happened to us because we are we come to this world with, with the pureness of our being, but because of ancestors, not blaming anybody. It's just who we are in the culture as humans. So what happened is like due to conditioning, due to beliefs, due to culture, due to whatever it is, uh, experiences that we have, layers start building or we start creating blockages. So what happened if I put layers and layers and layers to that light? There's a point where you cannot see it. And part of healing is to remove those blockages so that you can return to the light again and being able to perceive the light. Exactly. So why do we souls choose to have a human experience? Why is that good for us? Why don't we all just stay in bliss on the other side? Why, why come over here to go through all the things we come through? we go through? Yes, and I love that question. And that's because the whole idea is that uh, we remember consciously the nature of that we are. And we come here because the human experience, and I mention it all throughout my near death, contrast. This human experience is, is based on polarity, is based on contrast. So this is the best place to be able to experience like, how can I know or, or appreciate to say something healthy if I have never been sick? If I don't know that contrast, if I don't know the other side, I cannot see where I am. I cannot appreciate truly the other side of it. Like uh, how can I appreciate joy if I never had cry or feel sad? So this is this is what happened and, and I, I, I gave a, lot, a, a whole lecture about it, how we, we just from say that when we're a little baby, we just stayed in just that state of, of just absolutely being. But there's not appreciation for that state because we just don't know it. So we were talking about the eternity of our soul. 
So we come and live our human experiences and with every experience, we start having a little bit higher of that gratitude and appreciation for the true nature of what we are. So this brings us to not just to be a baby that is unaware to say something, but to go back to the pureness of being that baby with awareness, becoming aware of our true nature, becoming aware that we are consciousness, that we are awareness. And as you become more and more aware, you can help other people to become more and more aware. There's a wonderful story in your book that about the beings of life saving your life numerous times, especially one time when you were almost raped and murdered. Could you share that story? That's quite a dramatic story. Ingrid. Yes, yes. And, and I'm glad you're, you're bringing it because uh, it's a story that can help so many because it, it brings us to the realization of what happened when we are connected with, with the light, when we are what we call vibrating high, when we are a state of uh, calming the mind and being connected with, with the wholeness, with, with the spirit realm, with the wholeness of that we are. And that's what happened in this experience. And what happened was that um, I had an ex-boyfriend at the time and I was living in uh, Santa Marta. This is a city in Colombia where just, I was in college there and, and it's uh, in the Caribbean. So the idea is to go diving, to go snorkeling, just to enjoy all these places. And with this uh, friend, this ex-boyfriend, we went to the beach and it was Oh gosh, it's incredible how the contrast again in such a paradise, something so hard can happen. And it was, um, this area had this the beach, each beach was like a cove. It was surrounded by cliffs. So to go from one beach to the other, you had to cross these rocks and sometimes go in the water. So we did all these, it was an adventurous day. And then we arrived to the last beach and we couldn't cross anymore because it was a very, sharp and, and a cliff that went into the ocean and the currents were strong. So, okay, it's time to go back. And when we were going to go back and turn to the, just the other beaches to go back, three people appear, they, they turn around the corner and now they were there. And I'm like, oh, and at that moment I had that sense, Irene, they don't have good intentions. And I was right because at that moment they pushed us back to the beach and they just started to take everything from us. And I, at that moment, we just thought, okay, take our stuff and let us be. And they took all our snorkeling gear and even oh, pretty much they left us, they took our clothing and left us just with the, the swimsuits. They wanted everything. Okay, take it all. They tied our hands with ropes and they pushed my friend on to the beach to sit down and they had um, knives and a piece of glass and they put this piece of glass on his neck and they were about to cut his neck and he started to say, don't do anything to her. At, to that point, I, mean, I never thought anything else was going to happen. And the scene was so brutal and, and them like almost cutting his neck. It, you could almost already see that the, the glass was there in his neck that I turned around and I could not see this. And when I turned and, and I was in absolute state of terror, I turned around and I saw the horizon and it was this beautiful ocean and the sun was just touching the water. And it was like, you see the sparkle of the light. And I'm like, oh. the moment I saw this, is like what happened during my near death. I went to state of peace. And this is one thing, Irene, I, I said people that I, after my near death, I never fear death again. The fear of death was gone, but I didn't know this was how true this was until this day. It, it was the validation that that fear of death was gone because the moment I look at the horizon, and I went to the state of peace. The first thing that crossed my mind was, today is a good day to die. Wow. And now I am in that absolute state of connection with 
just, we call it source, God, universal greatness. I'm just there. There was no thought in my head. And I went to that state that we again call like emptiness. I didn't feel any fear. I didn't. And then at that moment, this guy, he was like about 200 pounds tall, strong. He pushed me down and he lied on top of me. But I was in the, again, like in, I was the super state of expanded being and I could not feel the heaviness of his body. Wow. Then I'm tied. And this is the other miracle. I mean, my hands were tied. And the moment the guy is lying on top of me and I'm just serene. And then he put his hand down here to do his business. And at that moment, my hand was free. I pull my head, my, I move my arm, I grab his face and I put his eyes in my eyes because he, he was looking down to do his thing. And then I put his eyes in my eyes and I said, imagine a person that is about to be raped that should be screaming, crying, nothing. And I just look at him and with this strong, but very gentle voice, I said to him, dear, don't do this. The guy just pushed like a coil like that, Irene, and he just jumped and he's like, we are living right now, we are living. And the other two didn't even dare to fight the guy and they all fled the scene. And I'm there lying on, on, on the ground and I'm just peaceful. And I stood up and I turned on my, on my friend. And at that moment, I knew they were going to come back. Because imagine, I guess, whatever layering he had fell at that moment, but I knew his conditioning was going to come back. And I look at my friend and I said, we have to go because they're coming back. I untied his hands. And like I said, I, I explained how the, the whole geography was the landscaping for people to understand that we could not leave the area through the cliffs because they were too deep into the ocean. And in the other side, we couldn't leave through that side because the men have left through the other side. Right. of the beach. So we had to climb the cliff. And I look at the cliff and I said, we have to climb. We were young, we were athletic, and like we were even pushed up, Irene, we climbed that cliff, and when we were at the top, I said to him, lower your head. And he lowered himself, and the, the men came back. And they're looking for us. It, I guess they, they walk a while before they realize, you know what, what would, why did we left? Let's go back. And when they came back to the beach, we're hiding in the bushes, and is when my friend said, how did you know this? How did you know they were going to come back? What happened? Why they let us go? And this friend was an atheist. So look at how we come here to teach each other. And at that moment, I said to him, if you didn't believe in guardian angels, if you didn't believe in God, this is the moment. Wow. He an amazing story. Quiet. And at that moment, we just hide and went quiet. But what happened incredibly that day, Irene, is that the day that guy and I touch our eyes, I was one with that person. So it's when I later, I couldn't understand it at that moment, but later in my life was the realization, there are no enemies. There's only conditioning and there's only all this layering and everything is here for a purpose. And later, who, who knew I could be grateful for that experience because that experience brought me to realize this wasn't done to me. This was done for me. To understand. Deep, deeper realizations, yeah. And a state of connection, that deep connection. That's amazing. So according to these beings of light, they've told you that suffering is a matter of choice. And a person needs to say yes to suffering before he or she can transcend it. Can you explain that to us? Now, a lot of people are saying, yeah, I'm doing my job over here, Ingrid. I'm suffering. But what do you mean that's a matter of choice? Yes, yes. Because um, what I, I said incredibly 
even with this um, experience in the beach, I, I, I said to people, when I surrender to that, I live. When I surrender to pain and suffering, I heal. And I said, when I surrender to what is, I found myself. Why? Because when we're not resisting is when we're allowing everything to be as it is. So I say, I said to people, and, and this is beautiful. I, I, I have learned this from, from teachings and, and, and I love when I heard pain plus resistance equals suffering. So we can have many challenges in our life and, and even painful experiences, but if we're not in resistance to it, then suffering doesn't come. It, it turns into an opportunity. I, you know, I cannot even use the word challenge anymore without saying challenging opportunity. Challenges doesn't have to turn into suffering, but opportunities for us to keep evolving, to keep growing, to keep asking new questions, to just even go deeper into the truth of everything that there is in the truth of who we are. So I said to people, if you meet your experiences, if you meet your challenges, if you meet your pain with open mind, even with, with the knowing, talk to your emotions, talk to the whole of that you are, to everything that is happening. And if you're not meeting it with resistance, you say, these, these two, this also belongs. These two can be here. Then what you're doing, you're embracing the totality that you are. And this is going to bring you, and what I always do when, when um, an emotion appears in, in my path, when a suffering, what I am turning into a suffering, I, I put my awareness there. And instead of repelling it, I ask anger why you are here, fear why you are here. Because we have been taught to run away from these emotions, and we have been taught that they are not good. You should not feel this, you should not feel that. And what I do is just, I sit with, when I, I said to people, you can do it immediately when it's happening. I, I, I do this, I, I name my emotions. And these are very ancient Buddhist teachings and Hindu teachings, just be with the whole of it. And then I, I'm feeling overwhelmed, 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 overwhelmed. Fear, fear, fear. So now I have clarity of what is that I am experiencing. And if people cannot do this at the moment when they are trapped in a situation, later they can gain the awareness. Go calm your mind and invite that emotion to be present. Overwhelm, fear, impatient, whatever, why you are here. What are you trying to show me? So it's when I say people, this is when you have a road that is split. And if you are identified with the story of me and why me, and the story of that you have created about anything, then you, I call it the call the sack of suffering. You get trapped in your own story and you become a victim of your story. When things change, the moment you pass, the moment you stop and you recognize the presence and the validity of that experience, why are you here? As the moment of you're also embracing and you're also going to the place of inquiry. Why are you here? And it's when at that moment you realize there's a purpose for this. What are you here to teach me? And when you ask a new question, guess what? New discovery, new road, evolution, growth. Healing. 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 Because part of it is that you can choose to heal those pieces and, and find out what is behind them and let them go. Yes. You know, you know, Irene, people ask me about free will. And I said, people don't have idea what free will is because people confuse free will with choice. I said, it's not about, yeah, you can choose what to wear, the foods you eat, the place you go, what you study, but the only true free will that exists if, is that if you choose to stay in the Call the sack of suffering, or if you choose the path of the light, the path of clarity, the path of asking. 
Oh, that's the true free will. It's fascinating. You've told us so much, Ingrid, and I know you've had also a few spiritually transformative experiences. Not that these have all not been spiritually transformative, and they brought teachings and clarity into your life and the lives of others. Is there any that you'd like to highlight for us? Anything else that you'd like to tell us before we move on to your second year death experience and what it taught you? Oh my God, is this just so many, so many teachings, so many experiences that I, um, oh gosh, I, 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 at this point, I'm like, which one we could call? <laughs> I'm sure you have like so many. There's been so, so many because he's been through all my entire life. And you know what? I, I could tell you um, there's, there's a, a very powerful, powerful one that is coming to mind right now. But the most important of all these, Irene, is that the being so light said to me that there was always going to be witnesses because it was important. It's important for us as human to have validation and it's important for us as humans. So what happened with all these, I always say to people, it's not just that we become self-realized beings. We also need to become self-actualized beings ground ourselves and bring all these teachings to a place where they can be shared. They can be um, at the reach of everyone else. So having witnesses is, is been incredible because it's always like not just a witness that could tell the story, but a witness that had healing things that transformed their lives. And in one of these experiences, Irene, it was a friend of mine, another atheist. He was very angry because he was born with um, some genetic problem. And he had a, a like a stain, like a blood vessels in his face. And there was a time when uh, we were walking and in, and in Colombia, there's a lot of problem with homeless people and Colombia has been known for being, in many cases, very dangerous <laughs> place to be sometimes. And, and we were walking in the street and three homeless people were approaching us. And when these uh, guys were coming again, it was the sense of like, oh, this is not good because they just were not coming with good intention. And then uh, they surrounded us. And at that moment, my friend, um, he was petrified in fear. I was standing there and I felt that I could not move Irene. And the men were surrounding us, surrounding us. And then they started to take everything from us and they uh, grabbed his money, his wallet. I was wearing a, a leather jacket. I had my bag, I have a watch, but it's like, I could not, I was, I couldn't move. I couldn't talk. And he's standing here, the guys were here they are stealing everything. They grab his watch because they say, give us your watch. And he couldn't take it off. So they rip it out of his uh, hand and they uh, scratch his skin and then left with everything from him. And then I said, Santiago, are you okay? Are you okay? And he said, because your arm is bleeding. And he said, I don't care about the arm. I don't care about the watch. I don't care that they took everything away from me. The only thing I care, Ingrid, is that they didn't take absolutely anything from you. They didn't do anything to you because you were not here. You became invisible. Yes. Yes. So this, of course, completely changed his life. Irina, that moment, he's like, and then he, 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 he transformed him. And now he became a spiritual teacher for the rest of his life. He just sharing his experience and even his uh, problem, his genetical problem turned into a way to help others, teach others. And, oh my goodness. Yes. And, and the beings of light actually rendered you invisible in that moment. So you couldn't hear. Yes. Wow. I think we would all like them to walk with us and help all of us all the time. What a blessing. What a blessing. Um, what was your second year death experience about? Oh, this is this one is really like I said to you, everything, absolutely everything carries a message and a purpose, Irene. And this is beautiful because later in life, when people have started to ask me this question I'm going to bring, they said, Ingrid, 
when people die in accidents, very bad accidents, uh, we feel they, they will feel in the anguish of their uh, loved ones that have left this world because of a very hard accident. Like if they suffer, if how bad this is for them. And I was amazed that my second near death experience happened in a motorcycle accident. And I, it was for me to, to bring them the peace that they didn't, didn't feel anything. And later on, I heard many cases and people that have had near death experiences where they validate this. Even my mom, my mom had a car accident when she was young. And she said all the time, the car is rolling three times down the road. And she said, Ingrid, all the time I was outside of my body looking at the accident. She said, throughout the accident, I didn't feel anything, not even fear, not even pain. Same thing happened to me. I was driving this a motorcycle and um, I didn't know how to work it well. It was my first <laughs> motorcycle and I was going on a hill and I have a friend of mine was sitting at the back and I was fearful that day. I actually didn't even do want to do this right, but he's like, oh, you can do it. And me, because I wanted to prove himself that, okay, I can do it. See the mistakes we make. I went on the, on the ride and I don't even know what happened. Irene, I went to put the gear and the bike jumped and I didn't have a helmet. Oh. Yeah. Oh gosh, being young and silly. And I was about 24 years old and the, mo the bike fell and I hit my head against the ground very hard. But even before I hit any ground, I, I never even realized I hit the ground. I was already, I was standing in the middle of the road. And again, I ran with the feeling of like, ah, I'm, I'm on the film again. So good. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> I'm ready. But at this moment, I'm saying like, oh, I'm just, there was not a bit of fear. There was no pain. There was no story. There was none of it. And I'm just there so ready. And I'm surrounded by light. And then when I am in there, and this is just like, this is so good. Somebody picked me up from the accident. And it's when I felt the touch, in the bodies when I um, went back to the body. Oh, oh, I didn't even realize I was out of it. I will tell you, this is incredible. I didn't, it was bad when somebody touched my body, I touched my eyes and I only could see darkness. And I realized I cannot see, I cannot see. Oh my God. And I was blind. So I was taken to the hospital and then when I, it took about a couple of hours for me to start recovering my vision. So my friend that was with me, nothing happened to him because he was able to jump. He was sitting at the back. He cannot jump out of the bike. And when we're, he's standing there and the doctor is there, the doctor, I said, what happened? And he said, oh, you lost, you had to lose your vision when you hit your head on the ground. And I said, I cannot be because I was standing in the middle of the road and I saw light, all the lights were on. And my friend looked at me and he said, no, Ingrid, there, there was no light. The road was pitch black. So the, there was no light where the accident happened. And by the way, you never stood up. So it's your soul again. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> again. Wow, that's amazing. Wow, you also healed yourself with some past life regressions. Let's yes. talk through some of your amazing, one or two of your amazing past lives. I know that some of the health conditions you came in with had to do with past lives, right? Yes, 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 Irene. And, and, and I write about that in, in, in my book too. And what happened is that um, I started, I went to this um, um, hypnosis event. A hypnotist. Yeah, it was this very well-known hypnotist. And when he did um, a session there, I, uh, they invited me to be part of his staff. And I, I, when I had the, the experience, I went out of the body and I'm like, whoa, this is cool. So I, and I was interested about hypnosis. So I went to meet another doctor. The story is long, so I'm just... Yeah, you you know, you're very poor. But I went to another doctor that practiced hypnosis and it was the first time that he's doing his thing. 
he, I went out with a question and instead of seeing my life, I started to see his life. So the important thing about why I bring this part of the, the, the experience is because it's the validation that what, what I was going to see in the future was real. Because it all started with, instead of seeing my life, I saw the, the psychologist's life. And I started to see his childhood and his traumas and everything. And I wow. recall all this. And he's like, I've never met this guy before. And he said, how could you know that? He's like, all this stuff. How can you know these things? And I said, Shh, silence. I said to him when I'm in, in, and I said, now that you know, you can be healed. Mm. And then this whole happened. And then he contacted another psychologist that was an expert in, in past life regressions. Because he was so amazed of what he was had so happened. so amazed and overwhelmed by what you had brought to him. Yes. So I, I went to this other <laughs> doctor and he started to just do this um, hypnosis thing. And this day I arrived to his office feeling very sick. I had uh, through the time with all that happened, I, I um, um, my illnesses, my respiratory illnesses went worse and I had asthma and chronic bronchitis. And this time I went to his office with a really bad episode of bronchitis. Oh my. So when he asked me to go with a question, my question was why I'm so sick? Why I have all these respiratory problems? And when I am in the session, Irene is when I go through and I remember my life since I was an infant and I saw myself when I was born in this life and, and I started to feel the cold of being born and that call of being born he brought me to see a life where I died as a prisoner in a dungeon. And in this life as a prisoner, I died from, I mean, I, I, it was cold. I was almost naked and I was in a, in a hole, almost in the ground with bars. And, you know, later I went to Italy and I saw the place where I died in wow. the hole. And then uh, I died from tuberculosis. And I praise the moment of my death because I was suffering so much. And this brought me to see more past lives. And in all those past lives, I had died from respiratory problems until I reached a life where I have a died from um, a spear going through my lungs. Oh my God. And the, that in that experience, in that death, guess what, Irene? I drowned in my blood. How did I die in my first near death? I drowned. So I saw these all like respiratory problems, drowning, all these related because the impact of dying from that um, um, uh, spear was such that it could not release that um, energy for so many lives. And now when I am in, in this office, I'm having this clarity and observing all these, I came back from this hypnosis and I said to him, I know, I know why I was sick and I know why I was sad and I know why I had fear and I know why I drowned. I knew all this and that very day, after being sick for 17 years, 18 years up to that point, I mean, that day I healed. Wow. I That's never amazing. had yet another respiratory problem until today. You just answered the question for people. Why should I find out about my past lives? That is amazing. And I want to, to, to tell you some validation quick before. So people can even see this with more clarity. A couple of years ago, I had a kidney stone. And then I had to go to the emergency room. They did a, a x-ray. And when they uh, saw the x-ray, they got all startled and all nervous because they saw a scar in one of my lungs. This, the lung where the spear went through. And I, and they, the doctors were like, oh my God, they thought it was cancer or something. So let's, they did like a follow-up of like two years, nothing changed. And the doctor said the only way you could have that scar in your lung is if you had tuberculosis. And I was laughing because I said in my inside, not in this life. But it was there from the other life. Or How the, amazing. So uh, we, all, we all need to think about 
certain things that bother us or there are certain markings on us or whatever could absolutely be from exactly. past life trauma. And this is, this is another thing, Irene, I said to people, you know, if you have the chance to know your past lives, of course, if you don't, because hey, everybody has to have the same opportunities. Huh? I said to people, you really don't need to know all your past life. You need to know your life today because everything that is happening in your life now is the reflection of all your lives. So if you know your state of being, if you know your emotions, if you know your life today, you know all your lives. Wow, so that brings me to asking you, because I know you teach, and I know you use simple but very powerful analogies, which you just did, that challenges a student's belief system. And through what you do, you help expand their awareness, and you change their perspectives. You just did that. So tell us how you teach people. Is this exactly what you do? Like you give people examples from what's happened to you or um, insights that you have that, can, that you perceive can help them? Exactly like that, Irene. Yes, I think I've, that's why I say people use the, 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 the being so light said to me with this clarity is not the experience, but the purpose behind the experience. So use all that uh, happening in your life by learn to see, learn to ask the questions and, and bring it and use that inquiry. What is this for? What is the purpose of it? So you don't stay at the level of the experience. So yes, I use all the experiences, but always going like, like squeezing the orange. What is this for? And how can I use this to help others? That's wonderful. And how about you also have unique meditation techniques because you believe by calming the mind, we can connect with our inner wisdom and regain our inner power, which we've been talking about. So tell us about your meditation techniques, because there's so many people who talk about meditation and so many different ways to meditate. What is the Ingrid method? I, would, I, I wouldn't say that is... Um my method but it's just all of us are able to um i guess utilize our uniqueness to pass say that that all of us can be drinking orange juice but we all drink it in a different ways from a different cup with a different taste <laughs> I'm not sure, I'm not sure. so um i uh, received these teachings from other uh, teachers and, and these are all ancient ways to to meditate and and but I just, I think one unique thing I, I bring to people for anything they're doing. I say to people, when you go to walk in meditation, I, I do one type of meditation that I also learn. It's called meditation for daily stress. How you just calm your mind wherever you are in front of your computer. You don't need to go sit in a place or you go to the park or be in a sanctuary just in front of the computer right there. Close your eyes and just calm your mind. But the most important thing of all, Irene, is I said to people, say that you went for a walk in meditation or, or just practice present for, from the office to the bathroom and you, and you had that um, thought in your head, I'm going to do my meditation. But your head was so busy with so many things that... From point A to point B, you realize, oh, I didn't do any meditation. I was not aware of my walking or I wasn't impressed with the trees, the wind, the birds. Right, or, right. or my mind was so busy. Right. And I said to people, that what we tend to do, to say, you're bad, Ingrid, you're bad. Oh, you, you oh, yeah, all that self-judgment. You so couldn't hard. do it right. Exactly. The self-judgment. So at that moment, I said to people, no, praise your awareness. Praise the fact that you were aware, that you become aware that you were not aware. How, when we are ever told this, praise your awareness. So at that moment, when you become aware that you were not aware, you're giving this great gift to yourself, the knowing that you are good no matter what. See the goodness in you, see the goodness in things. So at that moment, what you do, you stop. And now you are 
just changing the chip to think I am not good to I am eternally good. And I'm aware of what I was doing or what I was not doing. And that's conscious awareness, which you talk about in your wonderful book. Um, you have, and I, I really think that many people will now want to contact you and take advantage of the healing that you offer. I know you offer your healing in one-on-one -on -one sessions and you have an inner circle community and you also have online monthly gatherings, which enable people to understand the purpose behind their life challenges and it also helps them with grief recovery. Could you speak to this, Ingrid? Because I think people would really uh, want to contact you to, to get help with their healing and they have these choices that you provide. Yes, yes, and, and, and uh, because I think about how can we help anybody and with all the, the different budgets, because I said, people, if you cannot come to 101, my monthly gatherings are only $21. So I said, you just come and let's talk and I offer a teaching and we have question and answer. So is how can we help people at all levels? And, and we are all uh, having benefit from it. And yeah, during my sessions or during my teachings, I, I share meditations so we can pretty quick, I teach people how to quiet the mind in, in, in just one minute, in five minutes, and how to go back to that in just a state of connection and clarity. And, and the beautiful thing during my sessions, um, Irene, is that be, before the session, I, I meditate. And even the moment the person write to me is like the person agreed to connect. And I start having messages and even feeling I... I, I am an empath and I can feel what the other person is feeling. So before uh, a session, I, I connect and it is, it's beautiful. Um, people, but this is the thing. The most important about all of this is that although I receive many messages, the idea is not to disempower the other person. I'm here to tell you all this is like, it's a conversation with the other person start realizing I can do this too. And, and I am this life too. And, and how can I do to just be my super powerful me? So it's really beautiful because we share all that. And if the presence sometimes of a person in the other side can happen, depending on the, what the person wants to know and do. So this is separate from your one-on-one -on -one sessions and your monthly gatherings though. Your monthly gatherings are communities of people who talk about whatever is concerning them and different ways they can go about it. And in the one-on-one, -on -one, one person can work with you individually. With yes. Your, right? And what is your inner circle community? Oh, yeah, that, um, I have not gone that far yet to, I'm creating it. Okay. It is not open yet because, oh gosh, I, it requires so much work. So it's, it's a lot of work that uh, required to build the whole, it is more about the technical work more than gathering the people because already in my monthly mentoring sessions, I, I give a lecture and at the end we have a discussion. So my idea is that when we have the community is that um, have more sessions where we can do just questions and answers and just uh, be able to meditate together and do more one, uh, just gather as a community and do things together. But I am in the process of building just all the, what the website requires and how this is going to, is more the technicality than really. I'm getting. familiar, I'm familiar, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's wonderful. I mean, for $21, a person can, you know, gather with you monthly and, um, get wisdom and speak with other like-minded people. I think that's wonderful. And then if they want an extra special hit of, uh, or hit or love from Ingrid, they can do that too. Yes. Uh, Ingrid, tell us all the ways that people can connect with you. Oh, yes. Thank you so much. Yes. I, I, one thing I, I would love if, if people have the opportunity to read my book, because they just can it's get wonderful. Uh, I can't uh, recommend it highly enough. It was fascinating, riveting. Thank you so much, Irene. And, and yeah, it will be my website. And there's a, 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 my contact information. They can contact me through my website. There's Tell your website. What is your website address? It is 
Ingrid. I N G R I G. Yes. H O N K A L A. Honkala. Honkala. Exactly. Ingrid Honkala. Dot com. Okay. Okay. And then they can find out everything about your book. They can find out about what you're doing. And as you know, and everyone knows who listens to this podcast, part of the mission for Grief and Rebirth podcast is to provide people with healing choices, which we're certainly talking about that today. How does being able to truly listen to ourselves and others produce enormous healing? And Ingrid, why is it important for each of us to heal in this lifetime where we are now? We obviously came here to learn certain things. Yes, because I say people, why to wait? <laughs> Why to wait to feel good? Why to wait to not just feel good ourselves, but to offer the service of feeling good to others? Oh, that's absolutely incredible. No long ago, I, I asked the beings of light, Irene, what is our purpose and what is our mission? Can you tell me this with clarity? And they said to me, and is this simple? They said to me, Ingrid, Irene, everybody that is listening, your purpose is to be the light and your mission is to shine it period so we're supposed to heal and then help others to heal and pass it forward yes yes and pass it forward that's the service and, and that's when we just just becoming selfless and just start having the sense of you want to do this for others you feel so well that you want to share it with others and why it is important to listen because when we listen, look, Irene, is like listening is seen. It's when a person says, you truly see me. You see me. You hear me. So you witness that person. Oh, yes. Yes, exactly. And, and together now they're, they're, it's, it's, they're connecting. You know, I don't know if we have time, Irene, but the purpose of, of my near that experience was to bring the message of the power of connection. And I asked the beings of life, how come? And they say, you know, when you saw your body in the water and you left it behind, that was not your purpose. That was just your ego mind thinking, I don't want to be uncomfortable. You, you had a bigger, the universe had a plan for you. That's why you're back. The reason why you went to look for the maid and your mom. I said, wow. And I said, then, well, if I was going to come back, why did I waste time at the maid's room? And they said, that's, again, that's where we want to show you contrast. That's the point. They said, because when you went to look for your mom, what happened? Look at what is the communication does. Listening. As you said, your mom was intuitive. She was listening with her inner being. She said, unconditional love, absolute connection. See, love doesn't have barriers. You were in the spirit realm. Your mom was in the physical realm, but she could hear you. She knew. And she went back. What happened with the maid? She could not hear you because there was no connection. This person was even, she mistreated us. So there was no love. And look what they say. When there is no love, when there is no connection, they will let you drown. When there is no connection, there will be war. Oh, isn't that interesting? That's fascinating. I would assume the maid did not keep her job. Oh, no. That's <laughs> very <day. Move> on. <laughs> yeah. um, in a brightly guided light in your book, you state that we make the right choice when we allow ourselves to choose joy and love, which you just were speaking to, as the chief motivators in our lives. Why, and Ingrid, why is that important? And what is your tip, Ingrid, for finding joy in life? I think, I think that's because that's the nature of what we are, Irene. When we tap into the nature of what we are, that's the emanation of pure love. I said to people, always ask the question, because that's what I experience. And if you hear every near that experience, or if you hear anyone that had a spiritual transformative experience, or even yourself, I say, people, when you're in the zone, what is that you feel? <gasps> joy, 
because that's the core of you, that you are. So I say people ask this question, if the core of that that I am, is that of love, peace, joy, oh, just greatness, then the question is, what am I doing to not be that? What am I doing to not be that? And then, oh, at that moment you stop and you start realizing what can I do to go back to the core of that that I am. And I said, people, what you can do, one of the tips, one of the things I can say to people to go back to that is to practice gratitude. Gratitude, being grateful is the highest vibrational frequency there is, Irene, because what do you feel gratitude? The things that make you feel great, great gratitude. And the beings of life said this to me, to, to, to close with something really beautiful. They said, imagine Ingrid, how grateful every human being would be if they realize that for you to exist, trillions and trillions and trillions of subatomic particles have to be in agreement. Oh, wow. They say, Ingrid, Irene, all of you, you are a divine intention. Then they said to me, now imagine absolutely everything that is in this manifestation is, is I would call it the breath of God. This is an expression of source, trillions of particles and in agreement to be dispensed so I can use it. So imagine gratitude. I'm grateful with the spend, grateful with the water I drink, grateful with this temple, but with what we're talking, this, this body I have, grateful right. for you. So living in a state of appreciation and gratitude bring you there. And that brings joy. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you, Ingrid. Ingrid, you are helping countless people on their life journeys to become aware of this deeper reality and reconnect with our own inner wisdom. These teachings, along with your book, A Brightly Guided Light, Life, sorry, A Brightly Guided Life, which so beautifully illumines your own compelling life adventure, confirm that we are all spiritual beings living temporary human lives. I highly recommend A Brightly Guided Light as a fascinating must read for anyone interested in the mysteries of life after death. Ingrid, thank you so much from my heart for this moving and transformative interview. Bless you. And here's a reminder, everyone, that you can see the show notes and all Grief and Rebirth podcast episodes on irenweinberg.com. And make sure to follow us and like us on social at, at Irene S. Weinberg on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. As I like to say, to be continued, many blessings. And bye for now. <laughs>